OK, the recording and the transcription have now started. So we're going to talk today a bit more about risk. Um, last week we talked about ways to approach risk. Um, ignore it, transfer it, all that kind of stuff. This week, what I want to do is talk a bit about the types of risk that you might find in an organisation. Why am I doing that? Because if we can categorise things and it helps to, to look for them, because we, we tend to find the same things happening in, in other organisations. However, as I said last week, when I um, put in the different types, this is not a, a complete list, it's a reasonable set. Ali? It's uh, 20. Uh, what about the poll? Like uh, the submission will be tomorrow night. Ali, I just said that and you just watched me update the time and show it to you on Moodle. Weren't you watching? I was watching. I'm sorry. It's like the submission time is, uh, you know. Uh, I'm. <laughs> It's because I just showed you. Business. I just showed yeah. you the screen and said it was there. You just yeah. watched me physically okay. update it. Yeah, thank you so much, Tony. Okay. We'd already discussed the fact that everyone takes risks. Um, You take risks every day. Crossing the road is a risk. Organisations have the same sort of thing. They all have risks as well. Risk is part of what happens when you do anything. It's almost impossible to do anything without taking a risk. If you hire say, a new person to run your company, that might fall apart within 38 days because you hire the wrong person. If you decide to open a new shop, you might get that wrong. You might put the shop in the new place. Um, it, sorry, you might put the shop in the wrong place, which means that you don't get custom, which means that the shop fails. It might not have been wrong to build a new shop, but you might have got it wrong. In either case, it was a risk to do. So what we need to do for all our organisations is think about potential risks. Now, this isn't a one-off. Clearly, when you're doing it for your assessment, it's a one-off. But this is a continuous process. And as I've said before, depending on what it is we're doing, will depend on how often you revisit particular parts. Regardless, for any organisation, we need to figure out what the issues may be. So we identify them. And some people think there's some sort of magic about this. There's not. It's to do with understanding the organisation, understanding what's going on, and try to understand where it might go wrong. If you have a, a one-man delivery service with one vehicle, you might sit back and go, OK, what could go wrong? Well, that person might not be able to do the deliveries. They might be ill. There's a risk. The van might break down. There's another risk. People might be um, less willing to spend money because they have less money to spend in a recession. Knock on effect of that is those fewer deliveries, which means you make less money. That's a risk. So you have to simply understand the organisation understand the hinterland as well. In other words, the 
uh, where that organization sits in the wider world. And from that, try to understand where there might be a risk. And we mentioned last week that you do this as an individual as well. You look at your house and think, I don't want to lose my house. I will insure it to make sure that um, if something happens, it will get rebuilt. Not everyone does that. Some people decide to, the phrase is self-insure, but it's not insure. They just say, look, the chances are really small that I'll lose my house. All I'm doing is paying hundreds of pounds a, a year um, to, to insure it. I don't think it's worth it. I will therefore not do it. In other words, they've identified the risk. They know what the possible outcome could be. You lose your house. They've decided what the chances of that happening are, and they think that's fairly low. And they've decided what to do about it. In this case, accept it. So we do that for all these risks, and you started seeing that last week with some of the risk documents that I showed you. You need to identify the risk, figure out what that risk would mean. Excuse me. What would it do to your organisation or to parts of your organisation if that risk came true? Figure out how likely it is that it will come true. Reduce that risk if you can. And then put those measures into place. And again, you saw that when we looked at the, the documents last week. They identified the risk, they figured out what would go wrong. They showed what uh, measures they were putting in place to try and ensure that the the risk identified did not happen. So that slide is the core of what you're doing when you're uh, creating a risk register. You're thinking about the organisation and identifying the issues. And as I said last week, we do this all the time. We talked about road traffic accidents last week. And we talked about what we would do about them. We know they happen. The chances of them happening are pretty much 100%. But we've decided to not uh, change our approach. We haven't taken cars off the road. We've educated people about the risks involved. We might have mitigated the risk by setting up 20 mile an hour zones on the basis that if you get out by a car at 20 miles an hour, the consequences are much lower than if you get hit by a car at 30 miles an hour. That's the same approach that um, is taken when uh, humps are put onto the road. They're working on the basis that people don't actually read the signs, so they will put the humps on to ensure that they slow down. So we do this all the time. It's a similar approach, whether we're doing it personally, a small organisation, a large organisation, a government, a profit making organisation, a non profit making organisation, it doesn't matter. We have the same approach. The only difference is what the issues are for that organisation. And this is very much where you want to start reading that case study, because there will be general things. Will people still want their uh, goods repaired? Will they still come to that company? Does the cost of repair exceed the cost of replacement? So they are specific threats. But there are more general threats. Inflation's going up, which means that wages have to go up which means that the organisation has to pay out more money. Is that going to be a threat to the profits? Because if you have to pay more to your staff, you have to raise your prices, does that mean people will stop coming to you? So that's a general one for pretty much any business. 
or indeed non-business, anyone who employs any staff. So there will be specific risks and there'll be more general risks. So you should think about both. And when you're thinking about them, perhaps you could start to think about them from particular approaches. Um, so as I said, I've given you five here. There are others. But these are a reasonable overall approach. So we'll start with strategic risk. So organisations should have a strategy. They should make plans and decide this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to run our organisation. This is where we hope to get to. But of course, plans don't always work. Which is why when we looked at the plan a couple of weeks ago, one of the things in it was to say, how often are we going to look at this? How often are we going to examine whether we're doing the right thing? And the reason you do that is so you can change the plan if it's not going well. Putting in a five year plan and then not looking at it for five years is a very good way of ensuring that the plan won't work. So we need to examine what we're doing, figure out if it's working well, and if not, what do we need to do to change it to ensure that we get success? And those sorts of issues can come internally or externally. So we might have issues with retaining staff. Um, there's a national shortage of care workers at the moment because it's low paid and very hard work. Why is it low paid? Because it's not technical work in the sense that it uh, takes I'm going to try and be very careful because care workers do wonderful work, um, but it doesn't take you know, four years of training to learn to become a care worker. So almost anyone could be recruited to do it, but it's a very tough job working with people who are ill, working with people who have needs that need to be met is a very, very tough thing. It's not for everyone. And given it's so low paid, there's lots of staff turnover. People join up, they realise that they've got to physically move people or clean up after people, and it's maybe not for them. So you get lots of staff turnover, which means you have to recruit more and you have to train them again and so on. So there might be internal things. There might be external things. And just staying on the, the care um, example, part of the reason there is a shortage of care workers is because Brexit came in and a lot of our care workers were actually from other countries. And the big brains of the leave movement didn't take that into account. It's just one of the things that didn't take into account as a consequence of voting to leave. But organisations have all sorts of things that they need to keep an eye on. What happens if legislation changes? What happens if? And the what happens if is what we do in a risk register. If it's this happened, what do we do? It's no longer a risk, it's oh my goodness, how do we fix this? What we're trying to do is understand what might happen. So what happens if technology changes? What if, um, what if you're in the business of having shops all around the country that have DVDs in them? What if the technology changes such that you can download uh, films instead of having to go to the shop? Does anyone know how Netflix actually started? What their original business model was? 
hosting DZDs. Yeah. Their business model was, why do people have to go to Blockbuster to get a DVD? Why don't we just send it to them in the post? And they did that for a year or two. But they pivoted very quickly to supplying them online. Blockbuster pivoted to selling popcorn and drinks and didn't do as well. So you have to think of what might happen and think about how your organisation might have to change to cope with that. Netflix did well. Blockbuster, not so much. And um, I've got an example of that. Which I'm sure you've looked at because you've all read these uh, presentations beforehand. Anyone know what that is? And want to take a stab at what that it might be? Looks like a projector. It does look like a projector, yeah. Is it a, is it a really old? What what did you used to call the the films that used to go on the? Um, yeah, uh, I've I've forgotten about it. Is it the one that takes a film that you have to then project onto the screen? Uh, you're in the right area, but it's not about <laughs> film. It's it's more basic than that. Looks like there's a cassette in the at the end, a tape, a tape cassette. And I'm suddenly wondering how many people in this class even know what a cassette I know. is. And me too. <laughs> I think it looks like a VHS recorder or something like that. It doesn't. You're all in the same area, but you're actually more advanced. We're not um, quite at that yet. This Will is that be actually just a normal camera, Kodak camera. It's actually a Kodak digital camera. So that's the lens at the top. A whole bunch of circuitry underneath. To take the image coming in. Convert it to digital and then save it on that cassette tape. It's glued onto the side there. That's the first ever digital camera from 1975. And it was invented by Kodak. And Kodak did a lot of this kind of stuff. Kodak had a had a multi-million pound research and development group in a place called Rochester, New York. And um, they come up with stuff like this. And the people at Ranko that looked at it and went, isn't that lovely? Well done, you. So. Because the problem is, of course, Kodak. Was a big company. Multinational company who produced all sorts of things. They produced cameras. They produced the film that went in them. And for those of you who don't know what camera, cameras and films are, go ask your parents. They produced the film. They produced the chemicals that developed the film. They produced the paper that you would then print the photos onto. They had shops all over the world where you would take that film to get it developed, to get it printed. And they made billions of dollars from that. And they looked at this thing and said, so what you want us to produce devices where people don't buy film from us, don't need to get anything developed because the chemicals won't be required. They're going to look at them on their computer so we don't need paper. And of course, they wouldn't have to go anywhere to do this. They'll do it from the house. All the shops go as well. Who are you trying to kid? So they patted the guy in the head, said, well done, and sent him on his way. Given what we know now, do you think that was a smart response? We 
clearly not. I would imagine every single one of you now has a digital camera, possibly more than one. At the very least, it's on your phone. But those phones aren't made by Kodak. If you go and buy a, 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 digi a standalone digital camera, it's not made by Kodak because they didn't want to take that strategic risk. They were quite happy where they were. Other organisations were quite happy to take that risk. They didn't have multi-billion dollar uh, industries already going, so they did take the risk. And sadly, Kodak filed for bankruptcy 10 years ago because their business went. And this picture of the first Kodak digital camera was taken with a Nikon. 1975, Nikon was a company. They made cameras, but they didn't do the film, paper, chemicals, or all the rest of it. They just made the cameras. So they were more than happy to pivot to creating digital cameras. So you have strategic issues. What do you do? What is your organisation going to do? Where is it heading? And if you get them wrong, that can be a big problem. Next one is compliance. Not surprisingly, given that given the, the course that we're doing, do you comply with legislation? You do? Well done. Over next week, next month, next year. What if you decide that whatever you're doing, you're going to do somewhere else? Do you comply with the legislation in America if you want to work there? Now you also have to comply with EU legislation if you want to work in France or Germany or any of the other EU nations. Just as an aside, that's why the change to regulations always promised by Westminster can't happen. Because all you're actually doing is telling organisations, oh look, not only do you have to comply with one set of regulations, you have to comply with two sets. You have to comply with UK and EU regulations. Why do they have to? Because they still want to sell their stuff into the EU. So legislative issues are huge. They are ever changing and they change no matter where you are. One of the um, things that's allowed in America is to wash chickens in chlorine because the methods of battery farming there mean that there are particular diseases that get passed between the chickens and washing them in chlorine kills that. The regulations in the UK and indeed in the EU don't allow chickens to be raised in that way. Therefore, we don't get those kinds of diseases. Therefore, we don't need to wash chickens in chlorine. So we ban it. Well, except that they're trying to stop that ban. They're trying to say, no, let's have chlorinated chicken. Yum, yum. What about changes to other types of legislation? GDPR came in a couple of years ago and every single organisation that deals with anybody and stores any sort of records, and this isn't just an IT thing, this is anybody, needs to, to comply with GDPR for their records. Were you GDPR compliant? Did you have to change things? How much did that cost? So all of these things are risks. So you have to understand, excuse me, the legislative landscape in which you work. And not all organisations can do this. And we had a, 
discussion earlier about smaller organisations versus larger organisations, as though larger organisations um, were actually better at this kind of stuff. So as I was speaking about GDPR there, what about an organisation um, that's not compliant with GDPR? And three years ago, there was a specific organisation that wasn't compliant. And what they had done was if you phoned up this organisation, they were so big that they could afford um, voice recognition software on their phones. So you phoned them up and rather than saying who you were on the first line of your address and your postcode and all that kind of stuff, you just started speaking. And it went, oh, you've spoken to us before. We know who you are. We recognise your voice. Aren't we cool? Of course, to do that, you have to store the voice print of the people that phone you up. This organisation, in their haste to do this, didn't actually ask anyone if they were OK with that. And of course, voice print information is personal information. And therefore, if you want to store it and be compliant with GDPR, you have to ask people. They didn't, and they were found to be in breach of GDPR by the Information Commissioner's Office. Anyone know which organisation I'm talking about? Well, given that GDPR was brought in by an act of Can parliament. Your question, please. I was just going to tell you who did this. Given that this was brought in by an act of parliament, you would think that all areas of government would understand it. But the organisation that didn't follow GDPR was Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. The taxman fell fell of GDPR regulations. So if one of the biggest organisations in the country has a problem, Maybe it's going to be a problem for other organisations as well. The third category you might want to look at is operational risk. Things that happen internally. And I mentioned earlier about um, finance. Well, that can happen in the way we spoke about in week one where it can affect a whole organisation, but fraud can easily happen elsewhere as well. If you have someone whose job it is to write a cheque, or these days more likely print a cheque, or even more likely do a bank transfer. So if there's a bank transfer to be done, somebody needs paid, that's fine. Somebody should be paid a thousand pounds, and someone has the authority to go and do that. Lovely. But what if they, instead of typing in a thousand, type in a hundred thousand? Because they've made a, an agreement with the third party organisation. I'll send you more money. You keep half. I'll keep half. Broad in that kind of way is really easy to do. Anybody who's ever worked in a service industry, well, as a till, We'll know that. Somebody goes into a bar and orders four pints. Person behind the bar rings up two pints, takes the money from the customer for four, and only puts in two and keeps the rest of the money. Dead simple to do. So, Internal risks can be a problem as well. And I feel as if I'm picking on people, but it's not just people, of course, other risks exist. What about technical risk? And here I've talked about a, a, a main server or your computers. It could be simpler than that. If you're running a service company, let's see if we can think of a service company that we've been looking at recently. What if your phone goes down? And nobody can phone you up to say, can you come out and fix our fridge, please? 
What happens if there's a power cut? What happens if there's rolling blackouts? What happens if the lights go out and don't come back on again till the next day? No matter what's happening, you have to think about those operational risks and figure out what you're going to do if it goes, if those things happen. In other words, how are you going to minimise the damage? And the one thing that we know for sure is that every single organisation that exists will have fallen foul of operational risk. I've got some examples there and I have homed in on IT companies, but it's not just IT. Many times have you gone onto Facebook and it's not been available, or WhatsApp, or Google Mail, or your banking app? Have you ever gone into a shop and found it's closed because the there's been a flood because the toilets have overflowed? Have you ever turned up at a hotel and your booking hasn't been recognised because it's not been put in properly? or it's in for the next day or the next week, or it's put in under a different name. And if you get a name like mine, that happens all the time. Every company can have operational risk. Just like every organisation can have a financial risk, there is money going in and out of organisations all the time. And again, it can be small organisations. It can be the local judo club that takes in a pound subscriptions from each of the 30 people. It still has to be accounted for in the same way as ASDA have to account for their money that's coming in and out. So it doesn't matter if it's commercial, non-commercial, big, small, there will still be money involved somewhere. And the trick is to make sure that you've got more coming in than going out, or at the very worst, the balance. Because, of course, if you're putting out more money than you're bringing in, the organisation will have an issue. And lots of things can cause problems with finances. What if by a political act you lose access to 27 28 of your market overnight. What happens if by political action, the interest rate for loans changes? And whereas before you were paying 2%, now you'll pay 11%. What happens if the exchange rate changes? And it used to be a dollar was worth, it, a pound was worth $1.4. What if a pound suddenly worth $1.04. I don't know if this is ringing any bells anywhere, but for any organisation who has to cope with that, that's a huge risk. You've just taken out a loan to build that shop, your new pride and joy that you want to expand into. And all of a sudden the loan's withdrawn because the banks don't know whether they'll be able to afford to give you a loan. And certainly not whether they can give you a loan at the interest rate you've already negotiated. Ringing any bells anywhere. Good organisations will have thought about these things. What will happen if what would be the consequences if? What do we do if? What would the effect be if? Who should be taking this on to figure that out? And that happens all the time. Uh, a few years ago, there was a, a company called Penny's Seafood Processors. Um, if you've ever been into any shop and bought frozen food, they're a uh, their Young's is the, is a brand on them. But they had a factory in Dumfries and Galloway, and the factory was doing really well. Couldn't keep up with demand. Um, in fact, 
the demand was such that one retailer um, could take all of the output. So this one factory ended yeah. up sending all of their products, all their frozen um, seafood to one retailer. But things happen. Costs go up, wages go up, cost of seafood goes up. But what happens if the person that you're selling to, the organisation that you're selling to, refuses to pay more? That's what happened to pennies. Their costs went up. And their customer, which in this case was Marks and Spencers, refused to pay more for what they were buying. It wanted pennies to bear the cost of all these increases in raw materials. What did it do? Couldn't do it. It just simply couldn't do it at those prices. So it simply said to Marks and Spencers, thanks, but no thanks. Goodbye. And closed the factory and 577 people were made redundant. Can't think of much more of a higher financial risk than having all of your finances dependent on one customer. Because if anything happens to that customer, you're stuck. And the final one I want to look at is one that always seems to be happening now is reputational risk. And if you listen to some of the right ring press, they will name this cancel culture. The idea that um, people might not be too happy if organisations do particular things. You all have come across uh, examples of where organisations have done something or said something or put into place policies that people don't agree with. And people said, right, well, if that's the way you're going to be, it's not going to work with you anymore. We're not going to buy from you anymore. We refuse to go anywhere near you anymore. And of course, if you have a customer, if you have someone that you're working with and they refuse to work with you anymore, there's very little you can do. You can certainly shout and scream about all oh, cancel culture and you're not allowed to do anything these days. But in the end, people have a, a choice that they can make. And they can exercise that choice. You can't force them to work with you, to buy from you, to have dealings with you. And if you can't force them to buy from you, then you lose money. At the very least, knowing that the organisation that you're working for is not held in high regard will demoralise the staff. And if you want to hire new staff, are they going to go to an organisation that's had this um, reputational hit? Or do they think, no, I, I don't really want to get involved in that? It can happen in all sorts of ways. There was a, uh, an American pharmaceutical company who were blackmailed. Basically, some nutter wandered around, opened up some packets of their, uh, their medicines and stuck in some nasty stuff. Sent them a letter saying, if you want to know where this is, let me know. And let me know with lots and lots of used banknotes. And the company said, no chance. What did they do? They simply told everybody what was going on and recalled all of their products. A huge undertaking, hugely expensive. But it worked out really well. Because everyone looked at this company and said, look at what they're doing here. They know that there's two or three packets of, our, of their medicines 
that are going to cause an issue. What have they done? They've recalled everything so that no one's going to get hurt. That's the kind of company that I can get behind. If I need some medicine in the future, I'll go to them because I know that they'll do the right thing. Sadly, they spoiled it. A few years later, the same company under new management had an issue with manufacturing with one of their medicines. And this time other people found out and they refused to do a, a recall. And people simply stopped buying things from them. So reputational risk can be huge. Let me give you an example. What if you're a, an organization that uh, gets a company to create products for you and brand them with your own branding? And what if the ingredients for that product go up in price and you refuse to pay more? And by the consequences of your actions, 577 people get made redundant. M&S didn't come out of that route well at all. Because people looked at them and went, what are you doing? You want somebody to sell you something for less than it costs them to make? Who are you trying to kid? So there are different categories that you might want to think about, different categories of risk that you might want to explore and think about the specific items within those categories. And those are reasonable ones. As I say, there are others. Any questions? No? No, sir. OK, one of the things I want you to do, not right now, is um, on the back of that and the back of last week, I want you to think about the case study and the risks and the impact and what you might want to do about them. Okay. Um, as I did last week, I also want to go through some real world examples. But given that we had so many questions, I think we need a quick five minute break. Normally I do 10, but um, we're really struggling for time today. So will we take five minutes and I'll see you back here in five? Thank you, Tony.
OK, we are back. So has anyone thought of any questions from the stuff that we're doing? Before the break. Yeah, I'll take that as a no. Um, Like I did last week, I've got a couple of um, risk registers that I want to show you. And first thing to, to note here is that this is a specific risk register. It's the strategic one. As we've seen before, what we tend to have is recommendations with straight facts and straight information, and that's what we've started here. So we've got a summary, background, and then the main risks are shown here. And you can see that, like we, we looked at uh, last week, we've got a score. And they've shown these in um, the highest score in each of the categories. And they've said how they've come to that. So they've explained what these risk registers are and how they've come to this scoring. Because the people that accept this report might not be experts in risk or in risk registers or in how they're laid out or in anything else. The main part, though, is the risk register itself. And you can see that it's similar to last week, but more comprehensive. So we've got the same kind of idea. We've got the risk title and a description. What actually is the risk? This one, they've decided, OK, we're going to start adding in IDs so that when talking about them. We don't have to um, use the full title and just say it's this ID, go look it up. And we've also said it's going to manage this risk. Here it's the head of finance. So this is a finance issue. Budgetary pressures. So the same as with every other health uh, service. Lots of people need the service, less money to be used. They're saying what they're going to do to mitigate the issues. A reasonably foreseeable risk remaining. So even after doing this, this is what might happen. So they're still thinking about, oh, OK, what could be the issues here? And that's the core of a risk register. What can go wrong? So if we've done this and there still might be a risk, what do we do next? And then they have given a risk. Five times three equals 15 high. So it's the same as last week, except I'm not using the, um, the five by five matrix. They're just saying it's five likelihood the impact which is high and it's an amber but they have mentioned that it's a consequence likelihood risk matrix that they're using they're just not showing the actual graphic and then they continue on um They've gone into detail. So the financial one is very high. So the reason they've done some mitigation, the risk that they'll still have financial issues is very high. They're going to do some further work and they think that will bring them down a bit. But it's only gone from very high to high. 
patient's experience and outcome was a two by four. They're going to do some more work and they think they can get it down to a two by three. Reputational issues they think is a three by three and they think they can get it down to a two by three. So you can see immediately there's more detail here. There's more things happening. There's more um, headings to say, OK, this is what we've done. This is what we think will happen after it's done. We still have more risks and so we need to do more stuff after that. And then what we think is going to happen once we've done all of those. They've also said what their judgment of the risk is. Are they going to do something about it, which is the treat? Or are they going to live with it, which is tolerate? And they'll say, no, we need to do something about this. We need to treat this. And what we're treating it with is our financial plan. So we're going to change how we're doing things. Effectiveness of controls and status of action plan. So two things there. They're putting in some control measures and possibly further controls. And they're saying, OK, after we do that, how do we know whether they've worked, whether they've been effective, and where we are in the action plan following that? And they've said, we are going to keep an eye on this monthly. Because it's the sort of thing you can't let go out of control. Uh, as I did last week, I'm not going to go through all of these because they'll follow the same format. But you can see the next one is ICT, Agile Working, but they've done the same thing. Control measures, what happens after we do that? what else we might have to do and what would then happen if they did the secondary control measures. And again, this is a treat style. And they go through culture and practice, change program delivery, how they're going to do things differently in future. Governance. Governance is a risk. Failure to comply with governance requirements such as freedom of information, complaints, and other regulations laid down with the public bodies, Scotland Act, aren't just a compliance issue. Not doing them is a governance issue. Particularly when you have something like this, where there are clearly very specific regulations in healthcare. So issues in one area can lead to issues later. Compliance issues can cause governance issues. Demography and inequality pressures. This isn't something that the organisation is doing. This is an external influence. In short, people are getting older. Older people require more health care in general. Poor people require more health care in general. So the demography and the inequality pressures are going to increase, causing even more pressures on the system. Another risk. And there's not an awful lot you can do about people getting old. Workforce. Will we have the people? Will the people have the right skills? What happens when people get sick? What happens when people get thrown out of the country because of a political choice? And here they've got a second appendix. So they've got the actual risk register, but they've also been very clear about where things could happen. So they haven't just said, uh, one to five insignificant through to extreme, they've said, okay, 
What does that mean? In other words, they have taken the particular areas that they work in, which they've termed domains, and said, OK, well, an injury domain. A ninth significant one is, yeah, something's happened, but it's not even needed first aid, working its way up to somebody died. So they've been very specific about what they mean by severity. It's not just a one to five. They've been really clear about what it is they think this means. A complaint, if somebody says, oh, it's ridiculous, the toilets are dirty and it's just they're cleaned, well, that's just a one. If someone says we've had a had somebody kill our grandfather and lots of people do it, well, multiple multiple claims or a single major claim. So they've thought about it in detail in all of these different categories and then decided what that means in terms of their risk profile. All of which leads to a familiar uh, matrix here with our likelihood and our severity shown. Here, they've still got the red and green, but they've actually got two different types of amber. So again, similar but different. Anybody get any questions about that one? Sorry, and I should have said part of the reason I've taken two amber is action required or immediate action required. Because it's unacceptable. And again, they've shown what they think is a difference. Low is acceptable. Yeah, there's risk, of course there is. Moderate, yeah, we should do something about this. High, we need to do something about this now. And very high, it's intolerable, we just can't have this. So they've been very clear about what the risks are, how they've measured them, what that means in the different areas, and what the consequences should be. OK, one final one. And again, same kind of themes coming in, but a slightly different uh, approach and a slightly different uh, risk register. Here they've chosen themes, resources, planning, inequality, health, governance, protection and engagement. Well, look at that, governance is a risk as well. Now, I'll say right now that I have a slight issue with this page. Anyone want to make a guess at what the issue I have is? Would you have any issues with that page if you saw that in your organisation? Would anything there trigger a response? The issue I have is that they've, they've given colours, which is a reasonable thing to do. If you see something in that, uh, I don't even know what you call that, a light blue for resources. So anywhere you see light blue in the document, you know that's a resources thing. Problem is, they also have a red, amber and green. So anywhere I see governance, my first thought is, oh, that's fine, nothing to worry about, except it's not, it's actually about the colour of the category. So I have a slight issue with this. Having said that, um, here's an actual one of the risks on their risk register. So you can see that some things are the same, some things have changed. We've still got owners. Who is actually responsible for this risk? And the risk is that they don't manage their resources effectively. 
So not surprisingly, the finance officer and the chief officer are responsible for that because they get a certain amount of resource to deliver their objectives. However, the resource has gone down. At the same time, demand has gone up. How do you square that circle? And it's not easy to do. And what if you can't do it? Remember that this is a partnership here, so the different partners might have different views about what's happened and what's gone wrong, which could have reputational damage. Here's our traditional risk score matrix, four by five for likelihood and uh, consequences. And again, our mitigations, what are we going to do? But here they've gone a wee bit further. They've taken those mitigations, put them in a, in a list with a date when they will happen, given them their own status. And again, that's a red, amber, green. And they've said, how far through are they? So this is an ongoing one. So we've said before that we continually look at our risk register and try and understand where we are. Here they've said, OK, here's our mitigation. Here's what we're going to do. Here's when we're going to get it done by. And at the time of this report, here's how far through we are on each of those things. And you can see that the status, even though they've not finished, that the status is green because it's not at the time they said it was going to happen. So they've still got time to finish it and they're comfortable about it. This one, less comfortable and amber because they haven't done anything in essence since the last report. This one went from 15 to 30. This one has stayed the same. So since the last time they had this report, the last time they last looked at these risks, nothing has happened. And they're worried about that. This one has finished, so they've ticked it off. Yep, look, we've done that. It's in place. We're done. And you can see that it's 100% now from 70 the last time. So they've done it between the last version of this and the new one. So they've ticked it off. We are happy. See, I did it there. I moved my next page. I saw this big yellow thing and I thought, oh, something's gone wrong. And it's not. It's just the colour for... Uh, the planning theme. Same when I saw that big red bit there. It gets me worried. So they followed the same kind of layout all the way through with detail on what's happening. Here's a new one. Again. Wonder what the gear wheel means. I can work out what green, amber, and red mean. I can even work out what a tick means. Anybody want to take any guesses at what a, a gear wheel means? Options. Options could be. Any other thoughts? Thankfully, they have told us what it means. And they've said a gear wheel means not yet started. Now, I ask this of all my students. Can anyone explain to me why a gear wheel means not yet started? And this isn't this isn't a question where I have the answer. I'm I'm genuinely asking because I can't I can't make that connection in my head about a gear lever and not yet started. Margaret, were you coming on this? Yeah, I, I just wondered whether it might be because if it was based on an act that was about to happen or something or a law that hadn't quite like when we were waiting for G, the big thing about GDPR and we were waiting and we were waiting that maybe until something is published. But yeah, I, I could be completely wrong, of course. 
Well, no, I mean, that explains the not yet started thing. And that mm. bit I get. The bit I don't get is the symbol. Oh, no, neither do I. It's a bit, I, I haven't used that one. It's a bit weird. Um, um, and I mean, you can see oh. that they're, you know, a big green play, a kind of an amber warning triangle, uh, red, and that's a kind of American stop sign that they've used with the, the octagon. And I can pretty much get on board with these. I just don't get the gear either. Uh, the gear wheel. Do not get it at all. But fortunately, they've put it in what it is. And they've also explained what all of these things are. So you can see the stuff that I explained as we went through it. They've covered all of these. So that anybody that wants to know anything about what's in there can come here and understand it. And again, we've been talking about that in terms of your report. The things that you say people should do and then explanation later on for stuff. Um, if they have questions. Speaking of which, anybody get any questions about that one? Okay, if no one has any questions, I am going to stop recording.